The military's strategies against biological weapons was the subject of a congressional hearing last week. Experts from the biodefense and security industry testified during this hearing. It's two hours. Distinguished members of Congress, uh, uh, members of uh, the committee, uh, welcome to Fort Detrick. It's a great day to have you here. I mean, the, uh, looking uh, forward for a great afternoon. Here at Fort Detrick, we are living in very exciting days. Our mission of national defense, especially when it deals to biodefense of this country, has been going on for the past 50 years. But now with more, more focus and more energy, we're trying to deliver the right countermeasures, medical countermeasures, to any threat this country may face. This is a major undertaking. It's not an undertaking that only the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army will be able to take. This is, a, 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 this is a, an effort that is a national effort, and it has to bring about all the best minds and all the best uh, people to make the solutions uh, available to the American public. Uh, in, from my end, our focus is obviously our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, and we always have to think about them, and that's our main reason to be. But I understand that the threat is a threat, as you, as you all know, that encompasses more so than just the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. And because of that, we have uh, renewed energy. The good news about is a while back, uh, when we were not thinking in this kind of term, in this place, we ended up with a National Cancer Institute. We ended up with the Department of Agriculture. And we ended up with the uh, uh, NIAID, the, uh, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease, right here on campus, and brought about a, a, uh, a, an availability of a lot of people that really will bring the talent required to come about to the solutions that we need for the na nation. So based upon that relationship, what we're doing is uh, uh, really working hard to bring that about, working them out closer. And uh, because the real challenge that we face is how we can, com the challenge is to come about with the solutions in such a way that the, there is a compressed cycle. <coughs> right now, most of the solutions we work, it will take us between 10 and plus years to develop from the moment we conceive an idea or the moment we conceive a threat to the moment we come about with the right countermeasure or, or right solution. But we, the challenge for us, and I think it's a national challenge, is we need to come about with better, solu better ways to compress that cycle, working with the FDA, working with the Department of Health and Human Services, working with all the different federal agencies, to, uh, working obviously too with the uh, private in industry to come about with those solutions that we need to, to that the American people uh, need. So I think Speaking, you know, as the commanding general here for Dietrich, we're living on very exciting days. I really think uh, the, the good Lord uh, somehow managed to put all, all, everybody together here to work together to have an effort that is a, a very important effort. And again, I welcome all of you uh, to Fort Dietrich. And uh, I hope that if you have any questions or any issues, uh, we just bring it as the discussions come about this afternoon. But if there's something that I need to answer back to you, I will be glad to uh, address those concerns that you may come about. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to, to come about with the best answers that, that we can come up with. And with that, thank you very much for the opportunity to have you here uh, for Dietrich. My understanding is what we're going to do is we're just going to get something to eat and we're going to take a tour, um, a walking tour, and then we're going to come back and start this dialogue. Uh, and we'll all, by the end of the day, know a little bit more about what we need to know. So I, uh, I welcome you all for coming. And um, why don't we get something to eat? Great. Yes, here? 
Okay. Are we all here? Um, we've had an interesting morning of a drive-through of the facility. We are um, Fort Detrick. We've had uh, a great opportunity to uh, be uh, welcomed by General Martinez. Thank you, General. We've had the opportunity now to tour this this building and to see a level four facility, we uh, laboratory. And what we're going to do is we are going to um, basically, over time, forget there are cameras here, and uh, have a nice interaction uh, about um, what what uh, what we saw. Uh, about what this facility was, what it is, uh, what it uh, hopes to be, what our needs are in this country. Uh, we'll be talking about the protocol, biological protocol, uh, to some measure. Um, we will have a good interaction about uh, the good work that goes here and the extraordinary needs that our country has. Let me say in the uh, five years that my committee, uh, the National Security S Committee, has been doing its work on terrorism, we, uh, we know some basic facts. One basic fact is that we know that it's not a question of if, but when, where, and of what magnitude our country will face chemical, biological, <coughs> nuclear, radioactive, maybe major conventional attack. So uh, we, we go under the premise that it is a, a fact there will be attacks of various sorts on our country, and one of the uh, obvious needs is to protect against biological warfare, biological terrorist activity. I'm going to recognize uh, the vice chairman of this committee, uh, Congressman Turner, and then Ms. Harris is going to take over. And being the typical member of Congress that I am, I will always feel free to jump in and interrupt her or anyone else, um, but for the greater good. And um, let me just say that uh, uh, we're, we happen to be around a table, but we are all participating. I'm going to ask that those of you who are uh, sitting in chairs without the mics in front of you, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Uh, and I am going to empower you to participate in this dialogue. We do not want to leave today without having a good picture of what this facility does. And we don't want to leave today without having a good dialogue about what our nation needs to be doing about biological warfare. With that, let me uh, just uh, turn to Congressman Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that on? A, it stays it's, red, I think. Does it? Yeah. Wind it up. <coughs> okay. Maybe I could borrow this one. There here's, we go. Got one. one. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for organizing this event and this discussion on what is an incredibly important topic. I want to thank everyone at uh, Fort Detrick in this community who is hosting us and, of course, uh, General Martinez uh, for your efforts in enlightening us on what you do here and uh, the importance of your efforts. Um, I think uh, Chairman Shays has, has said very eloquently the, uh, the new focus that we all have on the efforts that uh, are conducted here at Fort Detrick. I know it. Uh, at one time, your focus was on the protection of our military and what they might be facing in battle, and now we're looking at how we um, might um, protect the general public in the face of very evil men who might use um, uh, weapons uh, similar to those that, that you look to find solutions uh, to, uh, to disarm. Um, the, uh, this is going to be a very enlightening discussion, I think, with the panelists. It's going to be interesting to hear what their input is as to what uh, our country could be doing both to enhance our preparedness uh, but also in our own processes to make certain uh, that we're doing uh, things the, in the most proper manner. Uh, but uh, I certainly have enjoyed so far the information that we've received, and I appreciate your hospitality. Thank you, Congressman. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, let me just echo uh, uh, the thanks of Congressman Shays and Congressman Turner on behalf of the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, which brought together this uh, visit today. Um, uh, we are ex immensely grateful to General Martinez and to all the folks at Fort Detrick for uh, the very informative uh, tour that we had this afternoon uh, and are looking forward to a productive discussion. Uh, let me also thank the two congressmen and the congressional staff that have joined us for taking the time out today to uh, be part of this dialogue 
uh, that we're hoping to facilitate between uh, members of Congress, their staff, uh, and government agencies on important issues related to nonproliferation uh, and security policy. My job here this afternoon is to be a facilitator, I think uh, I was described. Um, and that means uh, I'm going to talk less and try and, and uh, sort of encourage discussion. <laughs> Um, the first thing I want to do in that role um, is uh, to begin by introducing our speakers. Um, and then I will just take two or three minutes to say a word uh, about the threat, the reason we're all here, the reason this institution and, and USAMRID in particular uh, exists. So first let me introduce uh, the speakers. I'll do that in the order in which they're going to speak. Um, on my left, the first speaker will be Carol Linden, um, who uh, will soon serve, if not already, uh, is serving as the chief scientist for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency Chemical and Biological Directorate. Um, prior to this position, which she's just assuming, uh, Dr. Linden served as the director for medical, chemical, and biological defense research programs. Uh, and in that capacity, she managed all aspects of the joint medical, chemical, and biological defense program research funded by the Department of Defense. Our second speaker will be Dr. David Franz, who is currently a Vice President for Chemical and Biological Defense uh, at, South, at Southern Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Franz has held a number of, of tremendously important positions over the years. Uh, he has served in the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command um, for 27 years. Um, and has, among other things, held positions here at Fort Detrick, both as deputy commander <coughs> and commander of uh, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Um, he is one of the country's leading experts on biological weapons, biological defense, biological arms control uh, issues. Uh, our third speaker will be Dr. Uh, Ambassador Edward Lacey, who is currently with the policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, prior to that position, uh, Ambassador Lacey um, served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for verification. Uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Franz, uh, Ed Lacey has uh, worked on biological weapons, biological arms control issues uh, for many, many years. Um, and our final speaker will be Jonathan Tucker who is currently a senior fellow uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, prior to that uh, position, uh, Dr. Tucker directed the Chemical and Biological Weapons Nonproliferation Program at the Monterey Institute. Um, he, too, has served in a number of policy positions uh, within the U.S. government working on biological weapons control issues um, and had uh, a very interesting year, which uh, we may have some discussion of today, of service as an, as an UNSCOM inspector in Iraq uh, in the mid-1990s. So those are our speakers. That will be the order in which we uh, provide some brief comments this afternoon. Uh, our goal, though, is to generate a dialogue, a discussion. We are anxious for your questions. Uh, let's not make this too formal. I think all of us will try and limit ourselves to five or so minutes of introductory remarks. Uh, and to that end, let me just say a few words about the reason we're here, the reason Dave Franz and Peter Jarling, who is in the audience and so many of the rest of you, uh, worry about these issues, work on these issues. And it's really quite simple. Um, there is a threat in terms of biological weapons. There is a treaty that exists uh, that was uh, completed in 1972, entered into force in 1975 that bans biological and toxin weapons. But despite the existence of that treaty, there are believed to be at least a dozen or so, perhaps a few more countries that today have biological weapons programs. Um, according to U.S. government agencies, Department of Defense and others, uh, those countries include uh, Iran, Libya, Syria, North Korea, um, and of course there are still unanswered questions about Iraq's biological weapons program. Um, those national programs that exist not only in most cases are a violation of the BWC because the countries are parties to this treaty, um, but also pose a very real threat uh, to the United States, both in and of themselves and because of the possibility that those national programs will become a source of assistance to other nation states or to subnational actors who are interested in acquiring biological weapons capabilities. And that's the second major threat that 
all of us are concerned about today. There is the threat of national biological weapons programs, uh, of which there are 12 or 13 uh, uh, in, according to the U.S. government, but there is also it evidence indications that subnational groups may be interested in acquiring biological weapons capabilities as well. Uh, Al Qaeda, of course, is uh, the group that uh, has been the focus of uh, the greatest concern. Um, according to U.S. officials, uh, they have sought to acquire uh, some of the building blocks for a biological weapons program. Um, some uh, evidence of that was found in Afghanistan following uh, the war there a year and a half ago. Um, uh, there's less certainty uh, as to whether or not other subnational groups um, are working in this area. And there is, uh, quite frankly, and you may hear some of this this afternoon, there is uh, some degree of disagreement within the expert community as to how easy it would be for a terrorist group to acquire uh, biological weapons. Uh, uh, the Aum Shinrikyo, as we all know, tried to do so uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, but failed spectacularly uh, in its efforts to acquire anthrax and botulinum toxin. Um, that doesn't mean that terrorists can't do that. This, uh, I think to many that suggests that terrorists will, at least for the foreseeable future, need to draw from, again, the national biological weapons programs that exist in countries and that could be a source of assistance. So that's, that's the sort of general threat uh, environment that we're looking at. We've got national programs that are real. Um, uh, we've got uh, legitimate concerns about subnational terrorist interests in acquiring biological weapons. Uh, and that's why the range of policy measures we're going to be discussing here today um, are at the forefront of U.S. biological weapons uh, uh, nonproliferation efforts. Um, those policy measures which we're going to talk about include uh, biodefense uh, efforts, and Carol Linden is going to talk a little bit about those <coughs> biodefense efforts. Uh, they include redirecting uh, the expertise from the former Soviet biological weapons program, and Dave Franz is going to address that. Um, they include uh, trying to strengthen the 1972 Biological Weapons Treaty, and both Ed Lacey and Jonathan Tucker are going to say a few words about that. So um, with that, why don't I turn it over to uh, Carol Linden and ask her to say a few words about her own experience here uh, at uh, USAMRIT as well as about, as about the uh, biodefense program um, that is central to the, to the efforts of this institution. Thank you, Elisa. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, telling that I want to talk about three major points. I'll give you a short historical perspective on USAMRID, talk about the program and the facilities here, some of which you saw very briefly on your tour, and a couple comments uh, about where we stand now and where things might be uh, headed in the future. <clears throat> USAMRIT has its origins in an organization called the Army Biomedical Laboratory that was established in the mid-1950s to focus on medical defensive aspects of the research programs that were going on at the time. Subsequently, in 1969, when then-President Nixon terminated the U.S. offensive program, uh, part of the language in that, that uh, terminates the program, goes on to specify that the U.S. will continue to conduct a defensive program in biological defense. And with that, a new entity was, was built and created here at Fort Detrick and named USAMRA, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, which is where you are today. Uh, as, as we learned on the tour earlier, for those who were on the tour, uh, all the old facilities that were part of that program were subsequently turned over to the National Cancer Institute. When USAMRID was established, uh, starting in the early 1970s and through the 1980s, uh, early 1980s, the focus was on basic research. Uh, and ba the basic research program encompassed a variety of infectious disease agents across the spectrum of those that were assessed by the scientists uh, in, the, in the scientific community working here to pose uh, a reasonable threat in terms of threats to the warfighter, whether those diseases were endemic infectious diseases or whether they were agents that could conceivably be part of a weapons program. Starting in the mid-1980s and through the early 90s prior to the first Gulf War, there was an 
an increase in interest in the biodefense program that was driven by a heightened awareness and increased interest in the biological threats. Um, I think uh, our intelligence communities became more aware of what was going on in the then the Soviet Union and what kind of large program they had. Uh, and that caused an increase in the biodefense program and a lot more focusing of that program on specific threats that were assessed and discussed by the intelligence community. In the early 1990s, the Soviet Union collapsed, and of course we, we learned much more about their program and the just vastness of the program and how large it was, and, and Dave Franz will comment on that a little bit more. Uh, we had the Gulf War, of course, and found out what was going on in Iraq. Uh, subsequent to the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were engaged with the UK and Russia in the trilateral negotiations, which perhaps uh, Ed Lacey may comment on later on. And so there was a bit more focus brought into the program on those specific threats. At the same time, within the program, Congress passed Public Law 103-160, which was in 1994, fiscal year 1994, which directed the Secretary of Defense to consolidate <coughs> all of the chemical and biological defense efforts that were going on within the armed services and make them into a joint program coordinated and integrated at the Secretary of Defense level with oversight by the Defense Acquisition Board. Uh, this was implemented in fiscal year 96 with taking all of the, the budget for chemical and biological defense programs and placing the responsibility for management and direction of that budget within the office of the Secretary of Defense. All the time that this was going on, USAMRD was doing its mission and focusing on its mission of conducting research to focus on medical countermeasures, discover and develop medical countermeasures for biological defense for the warfighter. The program was designed to respond to the threats that we understood from the intelligence community, to requirements that were articulated by the user community, and by the need to get FDA licensure ultimately for these medical products. Now, I want to point out that early on in the program, we lived in a different regulatory environment. Prior to the first Gulf War, we believed that investigational products were, was an ex reaching the status of an investigational product was sort of an acceptable endpoint for the, the, the medical products, primarily vaccines, that we were focusing on. After the first Gulf War, we realized that that probably wasn't going to suffice. There was a lot of interest on the part of Congress, on the part of the American people, on the part of the FDA, on the part of the soldiers and other warfighters themselves, that we really needed to have licensed products for use in our warfighters. Uh, there's a whole other talk that, that I and others could give on the difficulties of licensing medical products for uh, biological defense purposes, but suffice it to say that it's only recently with the finalization of what's called the animal rule by the FDA that we have really a clear pathway forward to licensure of these products where we can demonstrate efficacy in animal models. Uh, that's a little diversion from wh what I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of the core mission here at USAMRD, but I did want to make sure that that was understood because it's a very important point. The research program here encompasses research to develop vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics for the biological warfare threats. There is a large array of these threats. They could be viruses, they could be bacteria, they could be toxins, uh, a number of these. They're the large number. So it's a large program in terms of the scope of the program. Uh, and the focus has been historically on the preventive <coughs> arm of things, that is the development of vaccines. Now, to work with these threat agents, bacterial, viral, and toxin agents that I just referred to, requires unique facilities. You saw the biosafety level four laboratory and patient containment area on the tour. USAMRID was designed in the, probably in the mid-60s, I guess, the design work was done 
So what you saw was, was not necessarily state of the art, the way you would build a facility today, but it forms the basis for every containment laboratory that's been built since that time. Um, and the facilities have been upgraded and maintained very well here. USAMRIT has one of only five biosafety level four laboratories in the country right now. Uh, within the NIH program, they are looking to develop, I believe, two more biosafety level four centers. It also has the largest biosafety level three capability and most diverse capability of any of the biosafety level three laboratories in the country that I'm aware of. The laboratories encompass a lot of safety and engineering controls, but what really makes them unique and makes, makes it important is the people and the expertise that are brought to bear on the work that's conducted here. I referred earlier to the problem of, of licensure of the medical products. Part of that testing that has to be done in the animal models has to be done in these biosafety level three and four laboratories requires special expertise to do those animal exposures because we believe the biological warfare threat on the battlefield to be in the form of an aerosol, we need to make sure that the countermeasures that are developed protect against that form of exposure. That may or may not be the natural form of exposure for the agents that we're talking about. For example, for anthrax, you can acquire anthrax through skin contact with cutaneous anthrax versus acquiring it the way folks did in October of 2001 through inhalation, which resulted in pulmonary anthrax. But anthrax exists in this country mostly in the form of cutaneous anthrax, and it's acquired by contact with infected cattle primarily. So there is unique expertise that is brought to bear on doing the research and doing the testing. And there are very few facilities in this country that have the facilities the capabilities and the expertise to do this kind of testing. Which brings me to my next point about the expertise and capabilities here at USAMRID. They've been used not only over the years to conduct and advance the research program, but also have supplied and filled a national need over and over and over again. The diagnostic laboratories here are now part of the Centers for Disease Control Laboratory Response Network. Uh, USAMRID, for many years, ever since its inception, has provided assistance when requested by other agencies to investigate disease outbreaks. And I believe there's, there's a handout here with the USAMRID briefing. I think it lists some of those. Uh, we'll make it clear that USAMRID and the Department of Defense have never had the lead in investigating these outbreaks, for example, in other countries or the West Nile outbreak here in the United States initially several years ago but have provided support when properly approved through the DOD channels for, to provide assistance in these. And their assistance has been critical. And of course, everyone is familiar with the role that USAMRD played in testing samples from the uh, office buildings and some clinical specimens after the exposures to anthrax in October of 2001. I might add that the technologies developed here for doing that testing have successfully been transferred to other laboratories as well as to contractors so that that testing capability is now uh, much more embedded in our national laboratory infrastructure than it ever was before. <clears throat> the research program not only focuses on the classical agents, but we've also been presented with many challenges over the past several years for things that may be emerging in the future, and these have been in, uh, discussed in many fora and of concern to a lot of folks, uh, genetically engineered threats, for example. How do we respond to those? Uh, there are some sort of basic research approaches that can be devised to do that, and we are taking those approaches and focusing on those threats in conjunction with other laboratories, especially those in the Department of Energy. People are also interested in multi-agent vaccines and alternative delivery systems for vaccines, we're working on those, partnering with industry. We're also interested in nonspecific medical countermeasures. There may be a multitude of different threats out there. How do we respond to that? We, we, I don't believe any of us think that we can march through 
one by one down a list of things and develop unique and specific medical countermeasures to each and every individual threat that we might possibly face. So we need to look at nonspecific countermeasures, things that act broadly, to perhaps to provide short-term protection against infections. We're focusing on those also. My third point, now and in the future, our landscape has changed. Many years ago, we were focused exclusively on the soldier on the battlefield, the warfighter on the battlefield. As we all know, we now face much broader threats, threats to the civilian population. These are not exactly the same as those that we have on the battlefield from the standpoint of what we're going to do to respond to those. I personally believe that on the battlefield, our focus is still on detection and prevention. Today I'm just speaking about the medical program, so I'll just focus on the, the protection piece, which we believe is best achieved through immunizations, vaccinations, or perhaps these nonspecific countermeasures. The response to the threat from the standpoint of the civilian population is probably going to be more one of detection, diagnosis, and treatment, a consequence management focus rather than a prevention focus. Numerous other agencies are involved in biodefense now. It used to be, life used to be fairly simple for us. It's not, it's very complicated. As the Chinese curse says, we live in interesting times. We've got the new Department of Homeland Security. We have the programs that are being conducted within the Department of Defense, but by another organization entirely, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And we have the new programs that were initiated in fiscal year 03 within the Health and Human Services, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, a huge program focusing on biodefense. Dave's going to comment a little bit on how we've been interacting with those other programs. Our scope is expanded. We're not just concerned with the warfighter anymore, but we have to work with the folks who are concerned with the broader context with homeland defense and protection of the civilian population. Last but not least, I'll point out for those of you who, who may have varying degrees of awareness, just recently, uh, by direction of Mr. Aldridge, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, at least up until the end of May when he left, uh, the program, the Chemical Biological Defense Program, has been reorganized. We now have the Defense Threat Reduction Agency responsible for the Science and Technology Program, the Joint Requirements Office responsible for formulating the requirements to translate the user needs into the program that's going to be executed, and the Joint Program Executive Office, which is responsible for advanced development for all of the responses to the chemical and biological threats, both medical and non-medical. Uh, I've been told I have very little time left, so that pretty much brings me to the end of the, the comments I wanted to make in this opening statement, and I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Dave France, please. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, it's great to be back. I first came to Fort Detrick and to USAMRIT in 1987. Uh, from Kuala Lumpur as a young lieutenant colonel. I'd been working on, uh, on cerebral malaria, and I was thrown into biological warfare medical defense. Didn't know much about it. Actually drug my feet a little bit. I didn't know whether I wanted to come here. I, want, I had another, another assignment in mind, but I did come, and I began working on toxins, botulinum, ricin, saxitoxin, uh, in the toxinology division just above us here. I soon became a. Where were you hearing all that noise from? <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't think they were dropping toxins on the floor, but I'm not sure what that noise was. Uh, I soon became the department chief and then the division chief, and then in '93 became the deputy commander at USAMRID here, and uh, had held that job for three years. And it was during that time that I worked with Ambassador Lacey on the trilaterals. It was during that time that I led three of the early UNSCOM missions uh, into Iraq, looking for those uh, that uh, looking at that biological weapons program at that time. I learned a lot in both the trilaterals and, and UNSCOM about the importance of intention uh, because of the dual use nature of facilities and equipment and people in biological programs. Uh, much, 
much more difficult to find a smoking gun. Uh, learned about uh, the difficulty of verification of compliance uh, with treaties during that time. Treaties are very important and we need that norm, but they're very difficult to, to verify compliance with. Uh, then in the early 90s, as Carol mentioned, the Gulf War came along and we were active here in supporting the warfighter, specifically in a, in a battlefield biological defense mission. We weren't thinking much about bioterrorism at that time, but it was, that was the transition period when we started thinking about the difference between biological warfare and biological terrorism and their enormous differences. In the case of both, you have the dual-use nature of facilities and equipment and people, which make it difficult. In the case of both, we lack real-time detection capabilities, uh, a real technical barrier to protecting people that we don't lack in the case of chemical warfare. If there were a chemical attack on this room and we had the, the presently available detectors here, we could tell you in time to put on a mask uh, before the levels were too high to hurt you. We can't do that with biological uh, agent detectors, and I don't expect to see those in my lifetime, ones that work in real time. You may want to discuss that. Um, the other thing that's different about biological uh, uh, terrorism is that it's a much smaller footprint. Uh, as I've said many times, the facility in which to produce a biological terrorist agent might be the size of my kitchen or yours, and the weapon might be the size of your toaster or smaller. And that makes that and, and other issues make attribution much more difficult in biological terrorism than in biological warfare. So we started thinking about those things in about 1993-94 here at USAMRID and actually made a major change in our mission at the time I came, became deputy, deputy commander. We had been doing vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics, sort of in that order. And our diagnostics program was focused on epidemiology, studying a thousand samples from Africa and, and to see what the incidence of some disease was uh, in that population. We turned that around and made it diagnostics, vaccines, and drugs as we began, began to realize that in protecting civilians, we probably wouldn't use many vaccines. We would have, the key would be breaking into an outbreak just as quickly as possible, as close to the index case as possible. And so we developed a brand new division here at USAMRID in 93 or 4 called Diagnostic Systems Division. Subsequently worked with the FBI and made them forensics capable and that was the organization that was here for this nation in October of 01 when all those samples needed to be tested. The other initiative, the other thing that came along was the Atlanta Olympics. We worked with OEP at that time uh, and also the FBI thinking again about terrorism, something that was new to us. How do you deal with a threat against the American people? Then in uh, 97, we increased our emphasis on education. This is one of my favorite areas because I think you get more bang for the buck with education uh, than anything else in biodefense probably, at least here at home and started the satellite teleconference that was broadcast widely throughout the world. Uh, the next year we joined, the, the CDC joined us and we did that jointly, um, the medical management of, uh, of biological casualties. And our sister laboratory, the Chemical Defense Institute, did the same thing for, for chemicals. Uh, I became commander in 95. Before I left three years later in 98, we also developed several recombinant biodefense vaccines the new PA-based uh, anthrax vaccine, the new recombinant botulinum toxin vaccine, plague recombinants, uh, uh, a new version of the smallpox vaccine. All of these subsequently, little known to the American people at that time, have been picked up by either NIAID or the DOD for advanced development. Uh, so this was an example of this organization working quietly uh, throughout those years when they weren't really needed or perceived as needed in this country and uh, their products were available when they became 
uh, needed. I left on a, on a Sunday night on the 27th of January with tears dripping off my chin. Uh, and it was because it was such a great honor to work with these people. The Institute, we often think about, well, we've got 10,000 square feet of BL4, 50,000 square feet of BL4, five, four, three. three. <laughs> we got the famous slammer, all these things, but it's the people the people of USAMRIN that have really made it over the years, and it was a great honor to, to work with these people, especially when they were little known and, and uh, didn't uh, command the respect that I thought they should have commanded throughout all those, uh, those lean years. I did leave in January of 98. I had become interested during the trilaterals in the uh, uh, Senators Nunn, Luger, and Domenici's the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which was begun in 92, I believe, and had been involved to some degree. After I left, uh, became more involved through the National Academies of Science and continue to, to work in that area. Get over to Russia uh, a couple of times a year. My last trip was just last month in, in June of 2003. Of, uh, and it's been very interesting to watch what I think is a very important program. When we went in there, in the bio area, it was really about 97. We were working in nuclear and chem before, but it was about 97, I think, when we got involved in bio. We had enormous influence, I think, enormous leverage with, with not a lot of dollars to try to keep those scientists at home what uh, Ken Alabeck described as 30 or 40,000 scientists and engineers in that enormous offensive program that Carol mentioned, keeping them at home rather than have them go to Iran <coughs> or Syria or Libya or North Korea, the, the brain drain uh, concept. And I think it was a very, very useful program. What's, but what's been interesting is now uh, the free market has developed in Russia and they've gotten a taste, those same scientists have gotten a taste of free enterprise. And as our influence with a relatively small number of cooperative threat reduction dollars has begun to diminish, the free market's influence has become enormous. Where we were unwilling to make hard decisions about triaging, should we keep this lab alive or should we just let it die? Uh, should we? Uh, keep this group of scientists together by infusing a little bit of money to keep them at home, now the free market is doing that for us. Uh, several of those laboratories have, have gone bankrupt. Uh, several of them have been purchased by entrepreneurs and now are successful and those people are employed doing legitimate uh, uh, biomedical research, now thinking about GLP, good laboratory practices, good manufacturing practices. This is the the world market. How can we get our drugs into into Western Europe and into the U.S. market? How can we get through the FDA? So an enormous change, a very important program, and I'll just close with uh, that's dealing with, to a great extent, with biological warfare. Biological terrorism is a little more slippery uh, problem to have to deal with rega with regard to changing intention in in people's minds, and I. I think uh, Thomas Friedman talks about the poverty of dignity. That's a different problem to deal with than just keeping former weapons scientists uh, busy at home so that they don't uh, proliferate and cause uh, biological proliferation into, uh, into other areas. And I think as we move forward, as the threat has <coughs> changed, our ways of dealing with the threat, both from the, the technical, medical technical standpoint, from the non-medical standpoint, and from the intention standpoint, are going to have to change. The answers uh, from the, the intention standpoint with regard to biological warfare are probably different than the answers that are the solutions that are needed with regard to biological terrorism. I'll stop with that, Elisa. Thank you, Dave. Um, let me ask uh, Ambassador Lacey, Ed Lacey, if you might say a few words about uh, uh, the Biological Weapons Convention and treaty-related efforts to deal with biological weapons threats. Uh, thank you, Elisa. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as Elisa pointed out, th the biological weapons threat is real, the threat is growing, and it's evolving rapidly with the pace of technology. The United States remains convinced that traditional arms control measures, including routine declarations and facility investigations, cannot be effective against biological weapons. Uh, biological agents and the facilities and equipment used to produce them 
for illegitimate purposes cannot be distinguished from their legitimate counterparts. Moreover, unlike chemical weapons and nuclear weapons, materials and equipment, uh, disease-causing organisms are widespread in nature, and the equipment and agents <coughs> suitable for the production of biological weapons can be found in a large variety of facilities throughout the globe, including private companies and academia. Um, Dr. Franz mentioned the dual-use problem. Well, the dual-use nature of biological weapons-capable facilities makes it simply impossible to determine a reasonably bounded set of facilities that could be sub subject to declarations and visits. And even if inspectors visited a facility producing biological weapons, the facility operators could, e could readily claim their work is for peaceful purposes and could easily clean up evidence of illegitimate activity with nothing more sophisticated than household bleach. So what then are we to do? Am I saying that the Biological Weapons Convention, the BWC, is useless? To the contrary, the BWC establishes the important formal international pro prohibition against biological weapons. Our objective is not to abandon the BWC. Rather, along with other measures uh, to combat biological weapons, uh, including enhanced uh, biodefense efforts, our objective is to strengthen implementation of the BWC. Uh, states' parties to the Convention can strengthen the BWC in a number of ways. Uh, they can enact legislation to prohibit illegitimate biological weapons activities. They can enhance biosecurity standards. They can improve disease surveillance. They can coordinate assistance in the event of a sus suspicious disease outbreak or uh, an actual biological weapons attack. They can confront noncompliance with the Convention. And they can urge nonparties to adhere to the BWC. In the past year, the United States and other countries have taken a number of concrete steps to counter the biological weapons threat. Uh, to mention just a few of these, uh, the United States has enhanced controls on dangerous biological agents and dedicated funds to upgrade the public health system's capabilities to counter bioterrorism. A number of countries have committed to improving their national export control measures. And the, wor the World Health Organization has initiated an effort to strengthen health surveillance systems. Additionally, the parties to the Biological Weapons Convention agreed at the Fifth Review Conference last November to convene a series of meetings over the next three years to examine possible concrete measures to strengthen BWC implementation. Uh, this year, 2003, the meetings will focus on national measures to implement the prohibition set forth in the Convention, including the enactment of penal legislation, and on national mechanisms to establish and maintain the security of pathogenic microorganisms and toxins. Next year's meetings will focus on enhancing international capabilities for responding to, investigating, and mitigating the effects of suspicious outbreaks of disease or alleged use of biological weapons. And next year's meetings also will focus on means to strengthen and broaden national and international mechanisms for the surveillance, detection, diagnosis, and combating of infectious diseases affecting humans, animals, and plants. And the, finally, the, the following year's efforts, uh, 2005, will concentrate on the content, uh, promulgation, and adoption of codes of conduct for scientists working with microorganisms and toxins. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to discuss the first topic being considered uh, by the BWC parties this year, national measures to implement the Convention's prohibitions. And I believe Jonathan Tucker will follow me by addressing the second of this year's topics, uh, biosecurity. Uh, with regard to national measures, the BWC requires states' parties to take national legal measures to prohibit and prevent private actions that would be at variance with the Convention. Specifically, Article 4 of the BWC directs states' parties, and I'm going to quote here, to, quote, take any necessary measures to prohibit and prevent the development, production, stockpiling, acquisition, or retention of the agents, toxins, weapons, equipment, and means of delivery specified in Article 1 of the Convention, close quote. Uh, Article 4 further specifies that such measures are to apply not only to nationals and the territory of the state party, but also to any persons and territory, and again I'll quote, under its jurisdiction or under its control anywhere, close quote. 
There are over 160 state parties to the BWC, uh, which, uh, as Elisa mentioned uh, at the outset, has been in effect since 1975 for over a quarter of a century. And yet, it appears that fewer than two dozen states have actually implemented legislation or measures. It is vital to strengthening the BWC that the state's parties adopt the required national measures. Now, what should these measures uh, uh, include? Obviously, every country uh, is a little different. But in general, uh, we believe these measures should incorporate uh, three sets, three sets of uh, um, uh, provisions. First, measures to ensure that dangerous pathogens and toxins are utilized only for legitimate purposes. These measures should limit access to pathogens to reduce the likelihood that they could be misused. In the United States, for example, it is a criminal offense for convicted criminals, illegal aliens, and unlawful drug users, among others, to handle dangerous pathogens. These provisions also, also should limit the development, production, acquisition, and retention of dangerous pathogens to authorized entities and persons. Likewise, they should deal with the personnel and facilities of the government, the private commercial sector, and academia alike. Uh, second, national measures should criminalize or provide uh, equivalent penalties for activities at variance with Article I of the BWC. Uh, these measures could actually provide an important deterrent uh, to illegal activities. And they should extend not only to the prohibited activities themselves, but also to attempts to engage in such activities, as well as engaging in a conspiracy to do so. Again, uh, using the United States as an example, it is a crime in the United States punishable by a fine and or imprisonment for up to life to knowingly develop, produce, transfer, acquire, retain, or possess any biological agent, toxin, or delivery system for use as a weapon. Likewise, it is a crime punishable by a fine and or up to 10 years uh, imprisonment to knowingly possess any biological agent, toxin, or delivery system of a type or in a quantity that is not reasonably justified by a bona fide research or other purpose. These penalties are directly tied to the BWC's Article I prohibitions. And third, national measure, measures should prohibit a state party from assisting other states or individuals in carrying out activities in violation of the BWC. Uh, such provisions should ensure that a state party's exports do not assist other states or individuals in the development or protection of biological weapons. U.S. law, again, uh, for, as an example, requires the President to establish export controls for products that could assist other states in acquiring the capability to develop or produce biological weapons. And uh, just so that I don't appear overly negative in terms of legislation, legislation can actually also be, uh, take a very positive note. Uh, and again, using the United States example, we have uh, the cooperative threat reduction legislation, which permits the United States to assist uh, other countries, notably the Russian Federation and several other countries, to eliminate uh, biological weapons uh, and equipment. Uh, I'll just conclude there. Uh, I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, the United States has adopted numerous national measures uh, I've just mentioned a couple, but the, uh, the, uh, the legislation is fairly extensive, uh, to implement the provisions of the Biological Weapons Convention. And we're hoping uh, this year, in working with the other parties to the BWC, uh, to be able to encourage the other parties to, uh, to follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Jonathan Tucker, please. Thank you, Elisa. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the measures that Ed Lacey mentioned, and that is biosecurity. Uh, the current emphasis on medical and public health responses to bioterrorism is, is clearly essential, and we've seen uh, some very impressive examples during the tour today. But I would argue that prevention of bioterrorism is just as critical to the extent it can be achieved. And a key element of prevention is impeding terrorists from getting access to pathogens and toxins from legitimate laboratories and culture collections. It's important to distinguish between biosecurity and biosafety. Um, 
biosafety, of which we've seen some examples today, uh, involves measures to prevent the accidental infection of researchers or releases of pathogens that could endanger public health or the environment. Biosecurity, in contrast, involves measures to prevent the deliberate theft or diversion of pathogens or toxins for malicious purposes. There have been some recent uh, bills that were passed um, to enhance U.S. biosecurity measures, including the USA Patriot Act in 2001 and the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002. And I won't go into much, uh, I won't go into any detail actually on these, these bills, which are probably familiar at least to the members of Congress and their staffs. But um, to point out that even though to its credit, the United States is strengthening its biosecurity measures. Uh, there is not a comparable effort on the international stage. And as a result, there is now a, a patchwork quilt of national regulations, with most states having no uh, relevant uh, legislation on the books and some states having uh, partial uh, legislation relating to uh, biosecurity. Uh, and the United States is not the only country to do research with dangerous pathogens. Many countries um, work on endemic disease agents such as anthrax. Several countries operate maximum security uh, laboratories such as the labs we saw today. Um, and there is a, a lingering proliferation threat from former biological warfare laboratories and scientists in the former Soviet Union, South Africa, and Iraq. About a third of the estimated 1,500 culture collections that supply uh, pathogens and cell lines to uh, biomedical researchers possess dangerous pathogens. And these cultures vary widely in their uh, degrees of biosecurity uh, precautions. The trade in uh, mic microbial pathogens is also poorly regulated. Many suppliers ship dangerous pathogens, in, I'm, I'm referring to uh, suppliers in countries abroad, with few questions asked. And because uh, regulations vary considerably from country to country, we've ended up now with an uneven patchwork of regulations with areas of lax enforcement that could be exploited by terrorists. Uh, so what should we do about this situation? Uh, Ed Lacey has made reference to a, an upcoming meeting next month uh, within the, or under the auspices of the Biological Weapons Convention review process to discuss biosecurity legislation and to come up with a set of guidelines. Um, unfortunately, only one week is being devoted to this discussion, which I think is, is far from adequate. And also, the United States wants to rely strictly on a set of guidelines developed by the World Health Organization in conjunction with other uh, international organizations and leave it up to member countries to, at their own discretion to implement biosecurity rules. Um, I think it's essential that we take a more active approach and a more ambitious approach to come up with a uniform set of global biosecurity standards to um, prevent there being areas of lax enforcement or lax regulation that could be exploited by, by bioterrorists. So what I would propose, and I, I think I be, would welcome uh, comment and discussion on this point, is rather than relying on uh, member states of the Biological Weapons Convention to implement these rules, is to come up to uh, establish a techni technical working group under the auspices of the Biological Weapons Convention that would negotiate a set of minimum global standards uh, and then create some type of international oversight mechanism to ensure a degree of uniformity and accountability in the national implementation of those agreed global standards. So the idea is that there would be a negotiation to develop a, a minimum set of uh, global biosecurity standards, and I can go into what those, what the basic elements of such a uh, standard would be. Uh, then they would be implemented through national legislation, and then there would be a, an international oversight mechanism 
to um, ensure that countries actually follow up on their commitments and, and implement these regulations effectively. A possible model for such an oversight mechanism is the Nuclear Safety Convention uh, adopted in Vienna in June of 1994. And this is a treaty that is designed to ensure um, uh, the safe operation of civilian nuclear power plants. And the, uh, the parties to this convention agree to apply basic safety guidelines, which have been worked out during technical negotiations, to the location, design, construction, and operation of civilian nuclear power plants and to establish independent nuclear regulatory agencies. The way the treaty works is that there, there are annual meetings of the parties. Um, member participating countries are expected to submit reports on their implementation of the agreed standards. And then other countries at the periodic meetings can ask probing questions um, and apply political pressure to make sure that countries are, are actually following through in implementing the agreed guidelines. So I think something like this uh, would apply in the biosecurity area. Um, just to give you an idea of what the basic elements of a biosecurity, um, the biosecurity standards might be, they would probably be based on a list of select agents or pathogens of, or, and toxins of bioterrorism concern. They would involve the registration and licensing of facilities that work with these materials. Um, certain requirements for physical site security to make it difficult for outsiders to get access to dangerous pathogens. Some system for accounting of pathogens, who has access, where in a facility, at what time. Screening of laboratory personnel to make sure that only people uh, who have gone through some basic security check are, are given access to these, these materials and that people who are uh, involved in a criminal or terrorist organization are ruled out or screened out. Uh, mechanisms for control of transfers and exports of dangerous pathogens, including uh, provisions for safe transportation, and finally, security ed education and training. Um, just briefly, some sort of guidelines for how these um, uh, standards might be negotiated. I would argue that it would be counterproductive to impose standards that are too demanding, uh, that involve um, expensive uh, technical and, and, and other measures, uh, and that the real focus should be on a, a, a set of um, minimum standards to strengthen the weakest links. Those countries, particularly in the developing world, uh, whose facilities are, are so vulnerable to penetration or, or diversion that they pose a, a, a real threat um, to international security. Um, I have a number of, of other points, but I'll uh, wrap it up there and, and leave them for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, before we open it up to sort of broader give and take and uh, those of us sitting at the table have an opportunity to, to uh, query each other on some of the things that have been said this afternoon, uh, I thought I'd ask General Martinez if he'd like to add anything uh, uh, in, in terms of remarks. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, we'd be delighted no, to just hear. Just to react to maybe things you've heard or comments. Yeah. I think, um, to, to sir, uh, a couple of issues um, of concern. One is, um, just as the first two panelists, I'm very proud of the work that USAMRIT is doing for the nation. I'm very proud of the people that before us and still the people today are working to come up with the countermeasures that we need to, that so we you need. You were impacted by the tears coming down the face. That, uh, uh, <laughs> sir, actually, I think some tears came out of my own uh, <laughs> eyes as he was talking because I can relate to that. Uh, we have gone through some tough times, but we have never lose. We have never lost. The, the side on the ball. I mean, the, the goal is to come out with the countermeasures for the soldiers, sailors, and marines. And I know that I can speak from behalf of the whole institute. Uh, we have never lost sight of that, and we're going to keep working fiercely at, at coming out with a solution for each and every one of those agents that we know today and the agents that we may not know but still may come out tomorrow. Uh, that brings the second issue. I mean, the, the second issue is there is a lot of things that we don't know in this business. There's a lot of things we know, and there's a lot of others that we don't. And part of the science is it's a never-ending story. I mean, it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey of discovery. Uh, our journey is a journey to, 
to come about, not only with the threat that we know and come out with the countermeasures to those, but as we have seen in the, in the not so past, past, I mean, issues like SARS, new emerging diseases that may not be uh, weaponized, uh, you just normally evolving diseases, but still we have to bring the brain trust of American science to come out with the solutions that the American people need. And I'm proud to tell you that this institute has been part of that effort, a uh, small part, but it's still a part that is critical to come out with the solutions because many of the solutions to all these, age, all these issues is gonna require a national commitment. It's not just the Department of Defense as, as we have been doing, and we, I, I think, we're still gonna commit to carry on the work for those things that are particular thrust and, and risk for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, but we're never gonna forget the greater good to the American public. And from the standpoint of uh, treaties, and uh, we, we have to, whatever work we do, we always have to be uh, quite clear, transparent to the American public, that whatever we do is in the effort of the American public, and that we're gonna be really gonna be uh, be open to scrutiny, we're still gonna be, uh, be able to publish, and we're gonna be able to share the knowledge in a way that will be meaningful so that we can advance medical countermeasures, and that's what we are about. So sorry, with that, that's why I can come out and from my reaction. Thank you, General. Um, both General Martinez and, and Dave Franz have uh, talked about the importance of the people that work here at USAMRID. Um, it's not the buildings or the BSL-4, it's the people, the scientists that do the, the work and those that support them. Um, I want to sort of open it up more broadly to those of you in the audience that are, are from USAMRID, see if any of you have any comments or reactions you'd like to share with us. Maybe put my friend uh, Peter Jarling on the spot here who has been working in this field for um, mm -hmm. many, many uh, years, uh, decades. Is 30. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter uh, uh, is uh, at the center of the efforts uh, that we are engaged in with, uh, with Russia. <coughs> Uh, to develop uh, uh, better ways of dealing with the threat from smallpox. Um, uh, he's also doing a lot of other uh, critical, wor critical work in, in the biodefense area um, and has, has played a, uh, a, a major role in the interactions with Russian scientists uh, trying to get them on constructive, uh, legitimate paths uh, and away from their biological weapons development uh, history. Uh, that Dave Franz referred to. Peter, is, is, is there anything that you'd like to share with us based on uh, your work with the Russians on smallpox, the broader, uh, you know, critical importance of the CTR uh, uh, efforts in this area? Well, all right, uh, well, so I'll, um, I'll answer that question. Let me say first that I'm, I'm uh, uh, privileged to have spent my entire professional career working here at USAMR. The reason I've stayed here is that it is a unique national resource. It's filled the national need for all these many years and continues to fill a need, as General Martinez Lopez um, alluded to. Um, I'd like to follow on one of the things that Carol said about generic countermeasures. We all recognize that with the plethora of microbial agents out there that can be used as potential weapons, it will be impossible to develop univalent solutions in the form of vaccines and specific antiviral drugs. And one of the investments that this institution has made over the years is to understand path pathogenic mechanisms, the common denominators of these microbial threats so that we can come up with generic solutions. For instance, we're now finding through our work um, on smallpox virus in association with our colleagues at CDC that the pathogenesis of smallpox is very similar in ways that are are astounding with other viral threat agents such as Ebola and Marburg and Lassa fever. And we're beginning to look at countermeasures that can affect the coagulation events that are associated with those diseases. Uh, one particular agent is uh, something that antagonizes uh, factor seven and actually appears to be a generic solution to all of those. And my point is that investment in basic science where it doesn't have an immediate product coming off that can be put in a blister pack nevertheless has an investment an investment for the nation that we're now proud to be able to collaborate with our colleagues at NIAID um, to uh, to work um, and and the development of animal models and what have you and the biocontainment that we have here now is facilitating bringing many of those investments that NIAID has to fruition because we're able to do the critical testing here. The challenge for us is to grow so that we can comply with the FDA requirements and what have you um, and uh, approximating GLP or good laboratory practices in this environment is something that we're all gonna have to work toward. 
Uh, to address your question about the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, I was privileged. Uh, uh, Dr. Franz uh, asked me to be involved with one of the early studies that the National Academy of Sciences did to go and uh, talk with our colleagues at the, uh, uh, the Vector Laboratories in Novosibirsk. For me, it was very illuminating to engage these people who had come here under some of the uh, earlier engagements with a, a great deal of suspicion and distrust, and to meet these people as colleagues, begin to exchange scientific uh, thoughts with them, develop a mutual trust so that we can now really consider these people to be our colleagues. And I can say certainly that uh, Vector is no longer something that we really need to be concerned about because we have now been able to engage them on work which has been uh, mutually advantageous. So I hope that in some form that program can continue. Thank you, Peter. Um, could I invite others from the Fort Detrick community uh, to um Share some thoughts with us, sir. Um, um, Jim Swaring introduced myself earlier, the W commander here at USAMRID. But I, I guess one thing that I'd really like to get across uh, and for people to understand is just the tremendous uh, brain trust that uh, exists here at USAMRID. Uh, we've been working on uh, bio, bio threat agents for well over 30 years, and there's just a such a rich environment of research here. And some, and we talk about the people, the investigators, and the support people that work here. And I think as the program for biodefense uh, develops across the country, that USAMRIT is going to be continue to be tapped more and more. Uh, that brain trust will be continue to be tapped more and more, and those resources uh, become more and more useful to the country. But I think just the main point that uh, that this uh, the people here, the science here, is really the core of what we know about uh, biological threat agents, and uh, is going to continue to be a real resource for the country. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Congressman Shays, Congressman Turner, uh, do you have any uh, reactions? I, I, I have a few reactions and a few questions uh, in general, if I could. Uh, one is I would love to um, ask Drs. Franz and Linder or uh, Jonathan Tucker, Ambassador Lacey, or our folks from our hosts, um, if when we had before our committee a few years ago, a very um, noted doctor of a major medical magazine who said in so many words the following, his biggest fear is that a small group of dedicated scientists could create an altered biological agent that could wipe out humanity as we know it. I want you to react to that. Um, and I also want you to react to SARS and what we have seen we appear to have been able to contain it. And which gets me to just a point I want to make is that in our hearings, we learned about the threat of biological terrorism as uncertain but grave, that advances in biotechnology can increase the threat, that controls over pathogens and dual use technologies are problematic, and preparedness against biological terrorism is weak. But that the bottom line is that working against man-made biological assault, we also protect against natural disease outbreaks. So my connection is, what have we learned from SARS? And I want you to react to that comment made by the uh, noted editor of a major medical magazine about an altered biological agent and its potential threat to humanity. Uh, Carol or Dave, do you want to say something first on the issue of, I guess, sort of an Andromeda strain being developed uh, in the laboratory? I'll take the first part of it and then add to it. Okay. Carol's been backing me up for years. <laughs> uh, I think the bottom line is anything's possible. <laughs> and But I think when you play with Mother Nature too much, you, there's always a give and take. I think the Soviets learned that in their program in the 80s when they were making drug-resistant bugs, bacteria. Uh, and you, nature does a great job of, of following a track that is, uh, that, that is right. And when you drift a bug off of that track, maybe it won't be as stable or maybe it won't grow as well. But I think we still have to remember uh, anything's possible, and I think we have to be concerned about. Uh, so difficult, uh, but unlikely. 
that's that's sort of my my bottom line. Possible but unlikely. Uh, but biotechnology is going like this uh, when compared to the trajectories of other technologies, and this is one of the factors that is has have all come <coughs> together: the political issues and the biotechnology uh, that have come together in the last ten years, and. We know there's so uh, relatively little we know about our own immune systems, and we're learning more and more and more every day. Most of that will be used for good, but the potential for harm is always going to be there. I agree with Dave. I was going to say, you know, invoke the old it's not nice to fool with Mother Nature line <laughs> because it's true that you can do a lot of things in the laboratory with microorganisms, but what you end up with are organisms that, that are essentially crippled in, in other respects. Um, but like Dave said, I mean, you can't ever say, no, that's just not possible. Sure, any, anything is possible, but, um, but there are parameters that, that living systems have to stay within in order for them to, to remain living systems. Um, with respect to what we've learned from SARS, and I'm, I'm speaking really just sort of as a, as a scientist and a, and a private person, uh, and, and having read articles in the newspapers, uh, I, I think what we've, we've learned from that is just truly remarkable. Over the past couple years, uh, the U.S. and other countries have really beefed up their public health response networks, uh, perhaps not to the level that we desire to see them ultimately, but certainly strengthened them in many respects. Uh, communication, capabilities for identifying agents, uh, doing diagnoses, and so forth. And uh, the response to, to the SARS outbreak, I think, was nothing short of remarkable in terms of, of the response. Be, should we gather some encouragement from, should we gather some encouragement from it? I, the I fact think that it didn't come to the United States, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we went back and instituted many nations, reinstituted quarantine. When's the last time we saw quarantines in this country? I was quarantined as a child with scarlet fever, and that was many years ago. Uh, but there's an arms control lesson to be learned here, too, and I, I throw this over to Ambassador Lacey and, and Jonathan Tucker, which is uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the context of the BWC and strengthening the BWC on disease surveillance and disclosure of natural outbreaks and so on and so forth, and look what happened with SARS. It was not disclosed promptly. It was not disclosed early. It could have been even better controlled had it been disclosed promptly, uh, like it should have been. And I, I, think, I think the arms control community needs to really study this case because we're not talking about a backwards country here where this started. I mean, we're talking about a reasonably developed situation. So um, I, I would encourage you guys to comment on that, too. Would either of you like to? Um, on the, uh, the nightmare scenario of a genetically engineered microorganism, I, I, I take the point that it, this is more difficult to do than is often described, but I'm, I'm somewhat more pessimistic because of some unexpected results of experiments such as this, the famous mousepox experiment yeah. in which the insertion of a single gene made a, an, organ, an organism much more virulent, at least in mice, and it appears that that may be the case in uh, human pox virus as well, though, though of course those experiments haven't, haven't yet been done. So the fact that a single gene can have that kind of unexpected effect suggests that this may be an area of real concern. Um, with respect to the more positive lessons of the SARS epidemic, I think there were two very beneficial outcomes of the, of the epidemic. Of course, there were, there were tragic human losses, but um, on the one hand, the remarkable speed with which the causative agent was identified through a re really remarkable international cooperation among virologists in many countries that were working because of uh, communications technologies and also willingness to sacrifice perhaps personal glory for the collective achievement of identifying a new organism, they were um, really, uh, within a matter of months, were able to identify the, the organism and develop uh, approaches to deal with it. And then secondly, 
a significant strengthening of the powers of the World Health Organization, specifically the international health regulations. And now I believe uh, WHO is, is empowered to investigate um, outbreaks of beyond the, the formally declarable diseases, but to any major epidemic disease. Um, and there was a, an ongoing process to strengthen the international health regulations, but the timetable was perhaps a, another five to ten years. And because of this, this global uh, challenge, um, that process has been greatly accelerated. Could I just add on that final point? I think the WHO powers have been strengthened even further, if, if my understanding is correct. Uh, WHO n not only can uh, deal with uh, diseases beyond the two that it has traditionally focused on, uh, but it also does not have to wait any longer for an invitation from a country to investigate a serious disease outbreak. And that is a major major change. Uh, it affects sovereignty of this country and others, but when we're talking about global health and the ability of a disease to spread so rapidly, as we saw with SARS, uh, it seems to be really a, a critical issue. Um, yeah, I, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add, I think Carol uh, had a very important point, and it, and it gets back to um, what I was speaking about uh, earlier. Nations are required to live up to their obligations, whether it's their uh, obligations with the Biological Weapons Convention or whether it is their uh, international health obligations. Um, and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, this, uh, the SARS uh, case uh, highlights the fact that uh, nations don't always live up to their obligations. And what I, what I would advocate uh, and am advocating is rather than adding obligations, that we start by getting uh, nations to adhere to the obligations they already have. Uh, one other point that Carol highlighted, and I, and I would just like to emphasize, and Elisa now has just kind of uh, brought up, national and international disease surveillance. Uh, this is something where the SARS case shows we're doing better than we did in the past. We're not doing as good as we have to do. Uh, this is an area where we've got to do better. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Congressman Turner, would you like to m make a few observations? Well, this, is, this has been a fascinating discussion, and it was an incredible tour. Um, when you listen to the various topics that people are giving such uh, thoughtful approaches to, um, you, you can certainly find a great deal of encouragement in a topic that is very scary. Um, <clears throat> today when we took our tour of the labs, one of the things that were discussed were the issues of protocol and uh, how materials are handled and how individuals who handle them um, uh, administrate those. And those issues were related to issues of safety. Um, when, uh, when you were talking in terms of uh, initially the focus of, of the facility being on the protection of individuals in the battlefield and now are expanding that to individuals uh, and the general public at large. Um, the discussion turned to issues of detection, diagnosis and treatment rather than the issue of protection and, and vaccination. And we know that when you go to the issues of detection, diagnosis and treatment as you were just discussing with SARS, you have an administrative process which is pretty extensive. And um, I understand that in SARS we were dealing with an international administrative process which unfolded much rapidly, I think, than most people would have, have thought. But for a, a possible attack here on our country that would affect the general population, detection, diagnosis and treatment is an administrative process that would go from the local level to the federal level. And I was interested in your thoughts as to how we are doing uh, from the panelists on that administrative process for uh, diagnosis uh, and, and detection and what you see are things that um, that we perhaps could be doing better ourselves um, for, for our country. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to tackle this question? It's a tough one. Carol. From the standpoint of, of detection, diagnosis, and treatment, um, in, the, in the civilian population, I think the detection piece right now is not so much the uh, physical or uh, mechanical detection of attack, but rather, uh, as we've just been sort of discussing with SARS, the detection that an unusual event is happening epidemiologically. Um, and I think we're, we're doing pretty well in that area now because of the education programs uh, that, that Dave Francis referred to, both within DOD as well as 
in the civilian community. I mean, there are enormous programs out there to educate the medical community and first responders. So I think if you, if you think about detection in that context, we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, diagnosis, we've made huge strides in our ability to uh, use various biotechnological tools to diagnose the diseases caused by uh, the agents of concern. In many cases, those uh, technologies or, or efforts have been uh, shared with the Centers for Disease Control and or they've developed their own. And so there, there's a robust capability both within the DOD laboratory network as well as within the national laboratory network uh, managed by the Centers for Disease Control for the, the diagnostic piece. For treatment, uh, again, we our program has had the lead at least um, in looking at the use of licensed antibiotics for treatment of bacterial diseases. Were it not for the research that had been done at USAMRID in the early 1990s, we wouldn't have a licensed indication for the use of ciprofloxacin for treatment of pulmonary anthrax. Fortunately, that was in place when, we, when people became affected by that disease. Uh, we had the licensed indication. And we've been working with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as well as the Centers for Disease Control, to evaluate other uh, more modern antibiotic therapies for their usefulness in treating the bacterial uh, threat diseases that we're concerned about. Uh, there are, at this point, few, if any, licensed products for the, antiviral, for the viruses that we're interested in, antiviral drugs. There are a number of them that are now licensed for use in treatment of, um, of HIV, but for the viral threat agents that we're concerned about, we're behind on that, but our program, again, is working very hard on identifying and developing those products, again, in conjunction with the Health and Human Services uh, laboratories. We also have a robust um, research program in developing treatments for the toxins. There, there simply aren't any real specific treatments for toxins available right now, but there are several promising approaches to developing products for those, and, and we're undertaking those. Dave, did you want to add something? One quick example of how we are better prepared than we were in 1984 when the Roshnishis put uh, salmonella on a salad bar. Uh, se uh, 751 people became ill. It took us more than a year to realize that that was a man-made event. How many minutes do you think it would take us today if 750 people became ill to, real, to think about it being a man-made event? That's about awareness and it's about education, I think. It's also about experience. But education can provide that awareness at a relatively very low cost. Other comments or questions? Jonathan. Um, I, I think there, we've made significant progress. Um, but I think there are still a lot of major gaps that, that need to be addressed, particularly at the state and local levels. Uh, I think CDC and USAMRID have really done an admirable job, but that knowledge and information has to get down to the local level, which is really where the rubber hits the road in dealing with bioterrorism, because um, all bioterrorism is, is ultimately local. It's just where the outbreak happens to, uh, to begin. Um, so. It's, there's clear that there, there need for getting more resources down to the state and local public health departments and first responders. I mean, just an example, the smallpox vaccination effort has forced cutbacks in, in other public health programs, such as child vaccination programs. So it doesn't make sense to divert resources that are needed for ordinary public health to, uh, to deal with bioterrorism problems. There have to be additional resources provided for that purpose. Um, there's also, as we saw during the anthrax attacks in the fall of 2001, there was a, a real problem of p public communication from organizations such as the CDC to um, general practitioners and other doctors who had to deal with patients who were really panicking about the possibility that they might be exposed to anthrax. There was really no good source of reliable information. Um, different uh, state and local public health departments were providing different guidance to uh, physicians, and so there was a lot of confusion. And I think before the next incident, we need to work out better systems of coordination among state and local with the federal uh, authorities to deal with this, uh, this problem. And finally, there is 
a patchwork of, of laws uh, to deal with issues such as quarantine, and there's a need for uh, better coordination to come up with more consistent approaches to um, public health emergencies. Thank you, Jonathan. Let me just uh, reinforce uh, two points that have been made around the table uh, in the last few minutes, because I think they're really cr critically important. One is we're clearly better off today than we were a few years ago, but there's still an enormous amount more to be done. Several uh, very reputable uh, experts groups have issued reports in the last few months talking about the shortfalls in funding for Homeland Security, including training and equipping first responders to deal with, among other things, bioterrorism threats. We are billions of dollars short. Um, if you talk to mayors, if you talk to governors, you'll hear that directly. Um, and so there's clearly more to be done by the Congress, by the executive branch, in terms of funding um, uh, responses to, to this threat and related homeland security threats. Uh, the second point is the, the very important language, linkage Congressman Shea has made between what we do on the public health side and bioterrorism preparedness. Um, Jonathan Tucker is quite right. We are seeing money from public health being diverted to bioterrorism. And uh, another example would be the budget of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases at NIH. They have seen their budget for basic research on infectious diseases drop, drop this year. Uh, at the same time that they have been allocated billions of dollars more in funding for uh, doing basic research on bioterrorism threat agents. We cannot afford to choose between these two things because, as the Congressman pointed out, there is a critical synergy between them. We need to develop surveillance capabilities. We need to do the basic research on pathogens because the work in the public health area translates over into the biodefense effort. Uh, and so there is an enormously much larger agenda, it seems to me, uh, on the public health side as well that needs to be addressed. Other comments on the floor and reactions? Let me, uh, sort of following that, in that vein of, of you know, what more needs to be done, we have we've spent a fair amount of time this afternoon uh, through the tour that we had uh, and the discussions, the presentations, sort of getting a better understanding of what's currently happening. Uh, Jonathan sort of opened in his remarks, began to address other areas where we, uh, we could be pursuing initiatives uh, to do more to deal with biological weapons threats. Let me, let me just sort of try and push the envelope a, a little bit more um, in that area. Um, Ed, let me, let me pick up on some comments you made. Um, you talked about um, the importance of national measures, that this would be a focus of biological weapons con uh, uh, convention parties in August, the importance of national measures, uh, in particular that countries adopt legislation prohibiting <coughs> the development or production of biological weapons on their ter territory. Uh, but it, it strikes me that, you know, relying upon Iran to, to pass domestic legislation outlawing biological weapons development um, is not really going to solve the Iranian BW threat problem. Um, so what, in, in more concrete terms, um, do you think uh, uh, can be done to, as, as you put it, confront noncompliance with the Convention? Because it seems to me that all of the initiatives you mentioned, while worthwhile in and of themselves, none of them really confront noncompliance with the Convention. The, the 13, most of those 13 countries are BWC parties. We should all understand that. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, none of the measures, though, that are being uh, considered uh, uh, really confront noncompliance by those parties uh, um, uh, that have BW programs. So isn't there more that needs to be done to address the, the biological weapons threats from, from countries well, within the context of the treaty? The, well, the answer to your question is there's much that needs to be done, but, but what is that much? You, you raised an issue. Uh, that was uh, raised for the first time, to my knowledge, in 1962 um, by Fred de Clay in an article in uh, Foreign Affairs. Affairs magazine where he said, after detection, what? And that's after you detect a violation uh, of an arms control or other commitment. Well, now what do you do? Well, we've been grappling with that question. We, the United States, have been grappling with that question s since 1962. Uh, in every administration because we've had this problem. And there is no answer. There is no magic bullet. Uh, what do you do about noncompliance? Uh, how do you confront noncompliance? Uh, we've, uh, various administrations have tried different approaches with different countries over the years. Some have proved effective, some haven't. Uh, uh, 
Uh, one example, uh, if I could, uh, uh, well, some of you might remember, but most of you are too young. Uh, back uh, uh, in the days of Ronald Reagan, uh, when there was a Soviet Union, which no longer exists, uh, and we had a Soviet Union that violated uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, commitments of the SALT II Treaty, that's Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, nobody remembers that either, and uh, Ronald Reagan uh, decided to respond in a tit-for-tat fashion. He said uh, the, uh, the Soviets were exceeding the numbers of strategic weapons they were entitled to by X amount, so the United States in turn exceeded the number we were entitled to by the same amount. Uh, did that get the Soviets uh, back into compliance? No, they came into compliance later uh, for other reasons. Uh, the Biological Weapons Convention uh, has been a particularly dicey one. Um, we, for example, felt the Soviet Union was in violation virtually from the time they signed the treaty. Uh, so what do you do about it? Do you, do you, uh, do you cease having relations with these countries? Still well, maybe. Well, and still maybe, that's right. Currently, well, no, not Russia. the Soviet Union, but the Russian Federation, uh, we believe, still has a residual uh, biological weapons program. Uh, do, you, do you end diplomatic relations over that? That doesn't seem terribly useful. Uh, do you impose economic sanctions? You can. Uh, Lisa and I were discussing this before the symposium today, uh, and that has mixed utility. Um, what, what we're doing right now in the, uh, in the biological area is we're trying to encourage the other state parties to join us. Uh, it's, it's lonesome being the only country that's out there uh, cl calling and clamoring for compliance. And there is some hope that if enough countries were clamoring for compliance that the, the violators would hear that message. Uh, at the very least, at the very least, it would be good if we could cut off outside sources of assistance to violators. Uh, and legislation is one way to do that. Um, export controls uh, is another way to do that. Let me just be the devil's advocate and push you one more time on this and then, and then sort of see if some of the congressional staff that are with us today would like to comment on this issue or, or others that have been discussed. Um, uh, what I was actually trying to get at was not what you do once you detect noncompliance. You know with certainty that a country is violating, but what, you, what we can do to deal with concerns about noncompliance under the BWC, which, as we all know, lacks any sort of enforcement mechanisms. Uh, the U.S. has called for strengthening the authority of the U.N. to investigate uh, the use of biological weapons or suspicious outbreaks. Uh, but shouldn't consideration be given to giving the UN authority to also investigate facilities where work that actually violates the BWC, the development, production, possession of biological weapons, might be taking place? Uh, Can I thought on that? Yeah. Well, uh, a couple of thoughts. First off, uh, uh, there is, as Dave Franz mentioned before, the trilateral process. Uh, if a nation is, in fact, innocent and has nothing to hide, uh, it can certainly work cooperatively uh, with other nations that are concerned about ambiguous activities. Uh, that's what the trilateral process was about when the United States and, and the United Kingdom expressed concerns about the, uh, the, the so I'm looking at Lisa, but she knows all this, the Soviet Union's biological weapons program. And, and we were allowed to send uh, teams in to visit facilities to try to assure ourselves uh, that, in fact, uh, there was nothing to be concerned about. Uh, but you mentioned the, uh, the United Nations. There is a mechanism. Um, the United Nations Secu uh, Secretary General, rather, can, in fact, uh, under both the uh, Biological Weapons Convention and the Geneva Protocol, can, in fact, uh, launch investigations. However, the, uh, the, the country in question has to permit uh, the Secretary General to send a team in. Um, and that's obviously problematic. If, if a country is violating, it's not going to invite uh, or, or permit a team to enter that country. On the other hand, I would argue that if a country is violating, it's not going to permit a team to come in in any case. Um, but there is some, I think there is some utility to, to that kind of exercise, because even if you get a no, that, that may tell you something. Okay, well, just sort of as a footnote, the Secretary General has the authority to investigate use only. Um, and what I'm suggesting is, is we get at what's actually, the BWC doesn't prohibit use. Right. 
right. prohibits developing and possessing biological weapons. So it seems to me facilities have got to be part of the equation. Let me turn to the congressional staff. We've got a lot of experts here from, from the Hill. Um, uh, we'd welcome uh, any comments or questions that, that you folks have. Before you get to the staff, I can just jump in for, for a second. The, the, the proposal that you made, which is so broad sweeping in power to the United Nations, which would give it um, authority even in our country to go to areas, and I believe that the General was telling us that in the, the beginning that the um, areas in which, um, actually, I, I believe you were describing that the area in which these materials could be made could be the size of a kitchen and the weapon itself could be the size of a toaster. And, and I, I just can't imagine um, countries that are in compliance, and no one would ever argue that the United States, even if in its efforts in, in defense, um, is, uh, is exceeding the boundaries of what we're permitted to do under the PWC, um, would concede such amount of authority and, and sovereignty. I certainly I think we all understand that the need for um, some international uh, pressure so that the PWC has some teeth. It has some compliance. Um, I think from the history of treaties and mankind, there's always been a problem of how do people enforce them and make certain that, that they participate. But um, I don't think anyone uh, would, would seriously want the United Nations to have such as broad authority in uh, areas of entering sovereign countries for this type of needle and haystack investigations, uh, specifically when um, we, we know that it is uh, a almost impossible task for to conclude it with any certainty. Well, clearly procedures would have to be de developed that would guide these sorts of investigations. We, we can discuss that further if people are interested. I'm not, I'm not suggesting, and we don't have today, a sort of carte blanche for the UN to do this. It would be under agreed procedures that have been negotiated internationally. Um, staff, yes. Congressman Chase, thank you, and Congressman Turner to, for the ability to ask this question. I work for Chairman Davis on the Committee on Government Reform. Dr. France, you said something really interesting to me. You said that there will be no real-time biodetection devices within your lifetime. Can you tell me a little about when there might be something like that and how far off that might be? Good catch. Yeah, good excellent catch. question. Yeah. Very good. Probably your you lifetime, you not mine. Life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, in the case of chemicals, as I said, we can detect now in real time. Uh, in fact, I've experienced this at Al Mutana in Iraq. We put an individual uh, down uh, upwind of us in, in mop gear with a de handheld detector. We all had radios. The wind turned across some of those old rusty barrels of chemical agents, and he said, "Mask up." We masked up. We were fine. Five minutes later, he said, "Unmask." We did. Uh, we're still talking a number of minutes uh, with regard to the biological agents. It's a completely different uh, technology that's needed, and there are a number of, av of them available. You either have to get the bug to an antibody uh, and, and move it through some difficult uh, stages to, and, and detect it in that way, that's too long. Uh, you have to uh, blast it with some kind of energy and see how it breaks up. Uh, and look at that spectrum, and maybe if you've seen, seen that spectrum before, you can say this is the same one I saw before, but if you're looking at Bacillus anthracis and Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which one won't hurt you and one will, uh, there's not much difference in that spectrum. Uh, or you can, you can tr look for some DNA in it and uh, find that DNA very specifically and with very great, great sensitivity, but it might take you 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, when you're, so, th so that's a difficult problem. So you don't have uh, timeliness. You also don't have sensitivity. In the case of something like Q fever or tularemia, where one to 10 organisms are all you need to infect you, uh, that's, like, that's truly a needle in a haystack, looking for this very small amount of material, 10 organisms. Uh, much smaller than the actually the quantity in uh, in mass of the chemical agent that you might be looking for, for example. So uh, we're just not there. What we can do in real time is say there are there's been a change in the number of particles of a certain size in the air. We can say that right now. But in that case, you see a lot of false alarms. So every time a uh, a cedar bush gets 
uh, bumped out in Texas or every time uh, our, uh, some trees here in, in Maryland are, are blown by the wind and some pollen comes out, you're going to have a change in that background. And it's a very messy biological world out there. Uh, and, by the way, there are bacillus species, there are other bacterial species that we may be breathing right now. So it's a very messy gamish, and I really don't believe we're going to see it in, in my lifetime, in real time. If we could, that would be a huge step forward because then I would have a, a little mask in my pocket, probably one that matches my necktie, <laughs> and I'd put it on real quick. I'd carry it with me all the time. You'd have one in your handbag, and it would greatly simplify the problem, but I don't think we're going to get there. You have, you have your channel. Sir. Yes. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh Handler with the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. Uh, question also for Dr. Franz, maybe the other panelists as well, on this question of global surveillance of diseases. I was a little bit puzzled where the, the conclusion was. Some were telling a story of the glass half full and some telling a story of the glass half empty. And if I can push you a little bit further on that, uh, it seems like the WHO budget's pretty much stagnated for the last several years. It's roughly $800 million a year. CDC is kind of overstretched as well. Even our domestic surveillance capability is not what it should be. If you could kind of rate things on a scale of 1 to 10, where do we stand on this question? If we look at the 1950s and 60s, I guess when Ford we had this kind of network of laboratories around the world that were tracking tropical diseases, something along those lines. We called the 1950s and 60s a 3 to 4 on a scale of 1 to 10. Where, where are we now, you think? Could I just clarify the question from my own understanding? You're talking about what the United States funds uh, the World Health Organization? No, the World Health Organization budget itself, $800 million. Wow, that's all. Wow. Thanks. I Good don't question. know that I'm the right one to ask. I certainly understand the importance of it. I think it's absolutely critical and very near the top of my list, right up there with education, because the sooner you break into it, this was demonstrated in the foot and mouth disease outbreak in the UK, demonstrated mathematically very carefully by statisticians after the fact in a paper in Nature in December 01, I think, how enormous amounts of dollars and cattle and, and so on would have been saved just by breaking into that outbreak sooner. So it's a critical issue. Uh, my glass is always half full, but <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we're a lot better off than we are, but Jonathan, uh, I'm sure, is right as well that we're not where we ought to be. I just want to expand on, on this on the surveillance issue. I think it's a journey. It's not either half full, half empty. It's we have moved further down the, that journey, and we are much better than we were before. As a physician, I always count not only on one system to do anything. I, I, don't, I don't believe that just by looking at a number, you know how the patient is doing. So you don't rely on just one system to, to detect diseases like this, because each disease may behave in a very different way. So what we're looking at is detectors as one, tool, one leg of that stool. The other leg of the stool is the shoe, leather shoe epidemiology. I, the epidemiology is going around and making diagnosis and really counting case by case, because some diseases like smallpox may present with just one or two or three cases. And you want to detect it at that level early on. And then you know something else this command is experimenting with. Uh, along with many other places around the country, is what we call syndromic surve surveillance, which is putting the net a little bit wider out, trying to figure out some patterns of disease, high fevers or cough or upper respiratory tract infection that may give us a lead, may give us a couple of days or maybe a couple of hours before we have definitive diagnosis using some clinical detection that there is something not in sync, there is something haywire going on. Then that, that will trigger then the other detector systems and will trigger then the shoe the letter issue the epidemiology. You cannot, what I'm saying is, I, I will not count on one magic bullet when it comes out to diagnosis and early detection. I think as a physician and uh, as a public health physician, you know, you really have to let, have a couple of options there available and never just put all your money or all your egg in one basket and then you figure out that that was not the right one. Let me just quickly make a link between what Dave Fran said about real-time detection and what the general and 
uh, Mr. Handler have uh, said in terms of disease surveillance. The very fact that we don't have a real-time detection capability means that that syndromic surveillance and other surveillance systems that we put in place are that much more important because if we don't have a, a, a system that can tell you immediately of the presence of a biological agent in the environment and what that agent is and then people sort of take the necessary measures to protect themselves, then we've got to have in place systems that catch people as they become ill as quickly as possible so they can be treated and, a, and an infectious disease in particular can be contained. Lisa, I should just add one, uh, one point. We were talking uh, in, the, in the question you asked me in my mind about detect to warn. That's so that you can be fully protected. You're warned in time to put on your mask and you're fully protected. Now, detect to treat is the, is the next step from that and it relates to what you just said. It's possible that maybe in four hours we could tell that a major facility or a major city had been hit and that's, uh, that's long before the surveillance system will kick in. So that would give one an advantage. So it isn't. Uh, uh, I think it's still useful to work on these areas, right. but I'm not very hopeful that we'll have detect to warn right. in my lifetime. You had a question back there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm uh, Laura Moranchuk with Congressman Lynch's staff. I had a question probably for Dr. Linden or Dr. Franz about uh, how successful the government's been so far in harnessing brain power for bio research efforts in terms of. Uh, have we, how are we doing on recruitment and retention? Um, are we devoting new resources to getting top scientists focused on these issues? Are there DARPA-like dollars that you can use to lure the academy into studying these issues? Are we recruiting at top universities? I mean, if I could personalize it, I have a friend who's getting his <laughs> PhD in organic chemistry at Harvard <laughs> this year. Uh, is there anyone at, at, up at Harvard right now trying to get him away from pharmaceutical companies and into government? Uh, that's always been a challenge, actually, in, in recent years. I will say that, to the best of my knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the, the turnover rate within this laboratory in particular has been remarkably low, uh, although you always lose trained technicians because they're highly desirable, and we live in an area right here uh, along the corridor between Frederick and Washington, as well as in the Baltimore area, a huge number of biotech companies. Uh, who continually lure uh, folks away. That being said, as Dr. Jarling pointed out, he's a nationally, actually internationally renowned scientist who's been here for 30 years, uh, simply because this is such a unique place to work. With respect to <clears throat> retaining folks and their ability to bring in new folks, the Department of Defense, uh, the Medical Research and Material Command, several years ago uh, participated and initiated a laboratory personnel demonstration program that uh, has some flexibilities in it and so forth for specifically for recruiting and retention of personnel. And I know that they've used those uh, on many occasions over the past however many years this program has been going on. I think it's five. Uh, there's now proposed legislation. Uh, for the entire Department of Defense for a completely revamped personnel system that would address, is designed to address, I believe, some of those issues. Um, I don't know, General Martinez or, or Colonel Davies, if you'd care to comment any more on that particular question. I've got one, I've got one little comment. I think as, as the NAID budget has, has increased greatly, uh, 1.75 billion, and the RBLs, the regional biological labs, and the the NBLs and the Center of Excellence come online. I think there will probably be some competition for some of these great people at the CDC and at USAMRID as universities and not-for-profits and other organizations have money to hire them out from government. In the short term, that will be bad. I think because we may lose some critical mass in in these two centers of excellence. Uh, ten years from now, we'll have a much better base in this nation because there are more opportunities for young scientists to come out of Harvard and work in, uh, work in these kinds of unique facilities that, uh, like the one Dr. Jarling has spent 30 years in. Sir, if my, uh, I participated in a National Institute of Medicine uh, meeting, actually Institute of Science. And uh, one of the issues is for the country, from the strategic standpoint, how do we foster an environment for the young people to really select the areas of science? 
we're having a, a major problem attracting young Americans into the areas of biolog biological research and, and the areas of physics and, and engineering. This is not just a, a, a USAMBRED issue. It's an issue for the country to, to be uh, dealt with. Young kids, for some reason, you know, in the old days, they, they were enamored with the guys going to the moon and, and they came to the engineer fields and they, they and somehow we have to kind of energize the, the young minds of America to come out to work on areas. And not, not only about defense, it's a very about technology and areas of uh, engineering that are gonna become critical to the, to the, uh, the well-being of the country. Uh, said that, the Army has, uh, we had engaged uh, under the leadership of our old Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Army on a program they call East River Mission. And what it is, we're trying to reach eighth graders around the United States. And we have partnered with some of our scientists are partnering with some of the classes. And the intent there is to uh, stimulate the young mind because that's the time that we need to engage. We need to engage not when they're in high school, but before they get there. Uh, engage them, make science fun. And in doing, trying to do that, trying to bring them, because if we just wait until the end, it's, it's too late, because now they're not doing their PhD work, and now they're not gonna be available for them to come over to USAMRIT, or to go over to work in the Department of Energy labs, or, or whatever else in the country. So I think uh, that's an issue that is far larger than an issue for the Department of Defense. I think it's an issue for the country. Just quickly make a comment to your question. We, you know, on the financial side, uh, we're allowing the Federal Reserve and the Securities and Exchange Commission to pay their folks more money, their employees more money than what government employees usually get. Uh, and, and we probably, not probably, we know we need to do the same thing in other areas, probably in this sense, more important, in fact, and deserve more attention in terms of raising those salary scales up. Um, let me just note that we've got about five or 10 minutes uh, remaining in our session this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> sir. Hi, my name is Ed Mills. I'm, I work for Congressman Carolyn Maloney, who represents part of Manhattan. And uh, following September 11th, you know, biological, chemical, other terrorist attacks is a large importance. Um, and we were lucky on September 11th not to have a biological or chemical attack occur in New York City. But one of the questions that came out of that is coordination between federal agencies as to who is the lead agency going to uh, do the monitoring. Is it CDC, EPA? Is it USAMRID? And I want to know if anyone on the panel could tell me as to the progress on that and what they feel is a, a good way to go uh, in regards to making sure that if there was a you know, biological or chemical attack, that the right agency is there, the right information is getting out, and that the public is you know, told what they need to be told. I'm going to jump in real quick, though, and then give uh, our panelists some time to think about this. One of the things the Secretary and HHS has done is he set up a command post that, that um, is really uh, cutting edge in terms of his ability, uh, excuse me, the department's ability to know what's going on and to be able to uh, engage all the different organizations that you said uh, have a role to play. I know they're working closely with the Department of Homeland Security, so, you know, kind of with Carolyn's help in this whole effort, I think we've made, you know, a, a tremendous leap forward here. But. Uh, I don't know if other members want Anyone to Anyone want to say anything on this issue? Who's in charge? I, that's basically your question. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the bottom line. Beyond who's in charge is that the fact that who's in charge is at the right. Is it is the coordination happening, you know, in your opinion, the way, you know, are you working well enough with the EPA, the CDC, et cetera, to make sure everything is uh, done probably the best way possible? I think, sure. good, I think it would be good to know whether the four of you feel in the work that you do, whether you get it on the peripheral edge, I mean, whether you're noticing in the corner of your eye or not, is do you see better coordination, particularly as it relates to biological, um, with the, the, the local, federal, local, state, and federal, and within the federal government? What are you guys seeing? Jonathan, do you have some thoughts on this? Um, I think there's been some improvement, but there is definitely room for, um, for better coordination among federal, state, and local authorities. Um, to some extent, it will depend on the size of the incident. If it's just a few cases, it could probably be dealt with by the, the local authorities. If it's a larger outbreak, then, of course, the, they will need support from, from the feds. 
Ed, did you want to say yeah. something? I just add, uh, this is, I can't answer your question. I don't know the answer, and it's not my area, but I will tell you, before 9-11, uh, I saw virtually no uh, uh, state, federal, local interaction, and since then, I've seen substantially more. Uh, also, um, the national security uh, departments and uh, like Health and Human Services, uh, pro before that we didn't we didn't mix a whole lot. We did a little. We didn't mix a whole lot. Now we mix a whole lot more. So I would say we're making progress. I'd like to try and bring the discussion around to back to the issue of biosecurity. We've spent a lot of time talking this afternoon about the importance of the research being done here at USAMRA, the work being funded by the NIH and the collaboration between the Army and I NIH and DOE and other uh, key players. Dave Franz talked about the billions of dollars more in research funding for basic research on, on dangerous pathogens, the many more facilities, BSL-3, BSL-4, that are being created, centers of excellence around the country to do research on dangerous pathogens. But as we've also heard, there, there is a flip side to all of this. Um, this is all dual use. And I guess a question I want to throw out to the panelists is, um, are we doing enough to ensure that in our determination to pursue an aggressive, uh, much needed biodefense program, we aren't training would-be future bioterrorists and giving many more people access to dangerous pathogens without necessarily having adequate uh, security arrangements in place? Anyone have any thoughts on that question, Jonathan? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a huge problem, and we, we really have to think it through and rationalize our biodefense program so we're not creating redundant capabilities for political reasons so that people can have a piece of the pie, but really because they're needed. Uh, so it, it should be, there should be a rational planning process to really minimize the number of BL4 labs in the country because of the, the security problems associated with them. I think we have to remember that the bugs are available everywhere, uh, and they always have been and always will be, and the biotechnology is getting better and our understanding of the bugs is getting better. Uh, so it, it is a potential problem, uh, but I, I think that it, it, it comes down to people again. And at USAMRID, for example, uh, we know the people that go into our suites very well. Uh, we had, uh, even when I came here in 1987, had very specific security procedures to get into suites. But it does come down to people in the end, and we need to think about, uh, about people as we, as we do this. It's a relatively small number of people in this country who will actually be working with the agents. It's a very small percentage of people who get into BL4 in, in this facility. But anthrax uh, can be worked. Anthrax can be worked at a BSL-2 At BL-3, and you two. don't even need a BL-3. Uh, and anthrax is everywhere. Uh, so I think it's very important, a bottom line, that we don't limit ourselves. We look very carefully at what we do in the name of security and safety uh, and make sure that it really does make a difference because so much good can come from these laboratories, good for protecting our, our population against biodefense, and it's very dual use. What we learned about the immune system, what we learn about pathogenesis is very dual use. So much, much more good will come from, uh, from all of these funds that are being spent on bioterrorism. Sure, uh, you know, life is dangerous, but uh, we have to realize that more good than harm will come from this, and the research will also help us with uh, attribution, which at present we're not very good at. Uh, we're getting better, but that's a very tough problem. So it's all very dual use, and we need to think about intention and about people as we develop these countermeasures. Okay. Um, one more final. Could I final just add one, one point? I, I, I take the point that, that these pathogens exist in nature, but it's to some extent a red herring because the, the highly virulent strains are not widely available, and it takes a, a quite a degree of expertise to be able to identify and isolate the, the more virulent strains, the AIM strain or the volume strain, which exist in, in, in laboratories such as this but are more difficult to obtain from nature. So we definitely shouldn't make it easier for terrorists to obtain the really virulent materials. So I think 
To the extent that we expand our biodefense programs, we should also enhance biosecurity and make sure that this, we're not creating problems in, in an effort to solve them. Thank you. Um, take one or two more questions, and then I think we're going to have to bring it to a close. Uh, my, name's my name's Dave Roop. I'm a reporter uh, with a publication called Global Security Newswire. Um, uh, this is actually to follow up on a comment that Dr. Franz made, and, and that is, uh, does the apparent inability to identify the source of the anthrax used in the anthrax attacks uh, indicate uh, weaknesses in our system now? What are they and what should be done about them? I think it indicates the difficulty of the problem more than it indicates weaknesses in a system. Uh, I mean, we've very... Not, I haven't been involved, but this nation has very carefully looked at the genetic characteristics of that those strains, looked at the uh, the physical characteristics and the chemical characteristics, and it's a lot different than uh, ballistic forensics, for example, where if you have a bullet uh, from a, a, a gun that has been fired, from a rifle or a, a pistol that's been fired, you see lands and grooves that have a signature for that uh, that weapon. This is a lot different. Biologic, they, uh, biolog biology is pretty squishy. Uh, and, and even though you can very carefully describe what you're dealing with, it doesn't necessarily take you uh, to a perpetrator. Okay. Um, obviously, we could go on for many more hours. Um, all of you have been terrific. The panelists have been terrific. I, I should have said at the outset, it, I've known all of these people uh, uh, for a long time, many of them for decades. I can't think of a, a more distinguished group of, of, of experts to bring together to discuss this issue. Um, we're going to need to bring this to a close. What I'd like to just do is turn to Congressman Shays and Congressman Turner and see if they have any, uh, Congressman Turner and Congressman Shays and see if they have any final thoughts and then, and then we'll finish. Well, <coughs> uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this and, and for all the expertise that we have uh, around the table. Uh, and having worked with uh, Chairman Shays on the issues of, of national security and uh, the aspects of what we might be doing uh, in preparedness for, for terrorist attacks, uh, there have been various issues where we've come to light where um, people's, the expertise that we have as a country is being applied to really sometimes the, the unthinkable. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, the passion that everyone has. And Ms. Harris, I appreciate your, your passion that you have for this and, and, uh, and the way you've conducted uh, this discussion. Um, with each of um, the discussions that through the committee that we've had on, on topics that um, are, um, are new to, to some of us, uh, there have been uh, recommendations that have come out of it. There have been ideas that have come out of them that I think will make a difference overall to the to safety of our country. And I, I just appreciate all the work that you all are doing. And I would just conclude by um, first thanking you, Elisa, and uh, the staff, I, I always am happy that we open it up to the staff because your questions are terrific. Um, I would thank uh, as well uh, Carol and, and David as well as uh, Ed and Jonathan. And uh, General, I usually refer to you as General, but since I refer to them in their first name, Lester, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we're proud of what your people do, uh, and we're very grateful uh, for your service and the service of your men and women to our country. And. Uh, um, just say that this is a, a, a process that our committee does. We keep learning more every day. I tell people being a member of Congress is like going to a large university and learning uh, uh, something new every day and having to get a passing grade on so many different subjects. So uh, uh, we, uh, we've got a lot to learn, but uh, I'll tell you this, our country is a lot safer than it was before September 11th. It's just that our, a lot of people don't feel that way because they had a false sense of security before September 11th. But it's nice to know on this issue and I'll conclude with this, that when we're dealing with the terrorist attack, we're also dealing with or helping to deal with the challenges uh, coming from Mother Nature as well. Um, sorry to give Mother Nature a bad name in this way, but uh, uh, dealing with the natural challenges with the help of Mother Nature, we can succeed. Let's leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now a schedule update. Book notes with author Connie Brook is next. 
On Washington Journal this morning, we're live from the new Robert J. Dole Institute in Lawrence, Kansas. And at 12.30 p.m., live coverage of the U.S. House. The next generation jet fighter is the focus of today's hearing with testimony from the Joint Strike Fighter Program Director and Defense Department officials. Live coverage begins at 11 a.m. on C-SPAN 3.